Now, this series is called Practicing the Presence. And, um, before, well, this, is, this was the format. We'll have teaching, uh, then group discussion, and then, then we're going to break into pairs. And the, when, we, when we break into pairs, um, I'll, I'll tell you who you're paired up with because I'm going to change it every week. I want you to have a different person every week just to practice. This is a practice. So what I'm going to have you do is practice this, this, this concept of iron sharpening iron. I'm going to have you practice it. So I'm, we're going to have questions for you to take back with, to, in a corner someplace, upstairs, downstairs, wherever, and ask each other these questions. Tell, answer these questions for one another. And the question, there will be questions, and then the last part will be a witness. Witness to your partner about this. And there will be something for you to witness about. Witness, tell him how God has done that for you. Because that's something we should practice. Because that's what Jesus told us to do. Witness. So, we're going we're gonna, to... This is all about practice. And so, the, these, are, these will be the sections of our, of our time. Uh, I'll talk a little more about this uh, later in the... Um, later in the morning. So, practicing the presence. We've discovered that this is a practice, or should be a practice, very similar to the practice of law or medicine. Why do they call it a practice? Well, they go to school, they get a degree, but that's not the end of it. Now they have to apply it and continually sharpen their skills to be the best they can be. In the case of a doctor, it's life and death. <coughs> and so the more practiced he is, the more chan better chances are he will save that life instead of losing that life. And so that, that one is certainly the most intense of them, but certainly athletic endeavors like the Olympics is another example of a very dedicated practice. So that's what the Christian life is meant to be. It's meant to be a continuum where we are directly engaging God in our daily activities. We are going to be deliberately taking you out of this building. This is the place we gather. This is the place we learn. This is not the place we apply. We apply it out there. So our entire perspective on this seminar is going to be practicing His presence while I'm walking around. When I'm at work, when I'm at home, when I'm out on the football field, wherever I am, that's where I get to practice His presence. And so that's going to be the context for what we do. Um, Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom. That was not a seek it when it's convenient or seek it at a couple, certain times of the day. This is a continual, have that in the forefront of your thinking. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Do you notice a key word in there? It's no. I know him. He knows me. My sheep know me. So the whole point of this is us knowing him. How do you know a close friend? How do you know your wife? You know them by paying attention to them, learning about them, responding to them. That's how we know someone. We don't know them just because we read a bio. When we read the Bible, that's what we're doing. So when to know him, that means I'm going to be interacting with him. This is a relationship. The Bible tells us what it is we're to believe and how we're to engage the relationship, but the actual engaging the relationship is going to be in your daily walk. And that's going to be the context for what we talk about. Now, there are several resources that you're going to find very helpful in this. Um, Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest, is the cornerstone. Oswald Chambers went to this deep, abiding place, and his writings reflect that. Uh, I've been reading this devotional for over 10 years. Uh, it's online. And so I never I need to get my computer into uh, on, on your web so that I can show you. But utmost.org is the website. Utmost.org.
www.ohmsdoc.org. Uh, that's my home page. So when I bring up my browser, today's reading is sitting in front of me. I found 10 years ago when I was reading his readings, I would read it once, and then I'd read it again, and then I'd read it again. And I'd be scratching my head going, do you really live here? Is this really your experience with God? And now I've found that over... Brother Drew... God is good. I know. I know. We just have to stop. Oh, oh man. How y'all doing? Oh, oh my no brother. Hey. Trying to skip that. Good. He <laughs> went upstairs yet, so. He'll, he may, yeah. He will. I'm sure he will. Hey, a, a text message that came in six sunk sections required attention. <laughs> cool. I, I texted him yesterday, and it was a book. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> oh. He just kept going down and down. What, is this thing going to ever end? So I, Thank I brought, you. I'm so glad to see you. That's it. all God. So. I, it, it, it always, it always is. I'm, I'm just, I'm so, uh, yeah, you're, I'm blessed. <laughs> just, so, I have found that over this decade of loss and deep spiritual development, I have found that now his writings are instructive and affirming. I was very, I've been very interested in that, that change. And so you will find that if you and get, we're going to ha hand out to you each week, we're going to hand out a sheet that's going to have the ISI, the iron sharpening iron questions that you'll be engaging with your partner here. But then below it is some, a section called daily manna, and there'll be six days of readings, either scripture, uh, it will be scripture, and then also selected readings out of my utmost for his highest. Uh, it'll be a date. And then you go into the book, you open it up by date, and, and they're, they're, they're on the topic of that week. And so we're going we're gonna to be taking you here. We want you to, we, we want you to, uh, to engage this. Um, Brother Lawrence, you may have heard of this monk from back in the 16th century. Brother Lawrence, there's a book written, Practicing the Presence. He was a, um, a cook. He was a monk. He worked in the kitchen. And he... he mop the floors and cook the food. And his perspective on his walk with God was unique. And so there have been several presentations of it. Um, I found that there, there, when you find this book, you'll find it written in uh, Old English, then you find it written in Contemporary English, and then there even uh, this one here is a combination of his book, and then Frank Lawbach's book, Letters by a Modern Mystic. And what they've done is they took Brother Lawrence's and took it from the third person and put it in the first person. He was so humble, he wrote all of his letters in the third person. And so they redid it in the first person so he would have a better flow of what he, that this was his witness, this was his story. And so I found that the way they've rewritten his writing, and by the way, they did the same thing with my utmost. He wrote, this was written, he was a preacher back in the late, 19th century into the 20th century, and his writings were more of a uh, King James version, if you will, and so, so this this you'll see an updated version, updated edition. That's the one you want because it's easier to read. I have found the other one, you know, the, the language is just a little choppy and it's just not quite as easy. It doesn't flow quite as well. Uh, Frank Lawbach was a, um, a a missionary over in the Philippines. And he went through a stretch of time where he was isolated from his wife and son. And he was on an island ministering to this group of, uh, of natives. And he, well, he, he found this same experience that Brendan and I have been experiencing. He found that same experience. And he wrote letters to his father. And so you will find that this is also very instructive. Uh, and he wrote a, 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 little, um, a little section called A Game with Minutes. And the game with minutes is, bring God to your thinking one second out of every minute. That's the game with minutes. And so always keeping God before me is the, is the um, objective. And so that was the, one of the little tools he used to be able to always keep God before him. And it's called the game with minutes. So you will find all of these materials will be very helpful in this, uh, in this pursuit. All right. So let's move into today's topic, and that is, what in the world are we doing here? What is the purpose of this life? Now, how many of you have gone through the purpose-driven life? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, that, uh, a lot of you. Okay. 
Purpose Driven Life. If you have not gone through it, it's a 40-day study. Very easy to get through. And it's written by Rick Warren, uh, pastor of Saddleback Church. I think that's in Atlanta. No, California. 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 And um, th this has been used, oh my goodness, it, 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 the, the millions and millions of people that have gotten really deep into the Christian faith because of this book. Um, even, one, even a member of this church who, doesn't, who moved to Atlanta got, was introduced was introduced to God and got him on the track with this book. Uh, Brendan and he engaged in a study of this, and it, and it set him on the path of, took him out of his darkness and just put him on a path that was uh, pretty profound, actually. Um, comes in a couple different forms. There's also, this is my favorite, by the way, all of these books, Letters by a Modern Mystic, any of these books, you can take, take one, read it, bring it back, whatever. If you keep it, it doesn't matter, whatever you... Uh, whatever you're led uh, to do, give it away, uh, it doesn't matter. Please don't take this one. I'll keep this one over here. Uh, this is all of the scripture that Rick Warren references in The Purpose Driven Life, and it's a ton. And so when you open this book, this is called Daily Inspiration for The Purpose Driven Life. When you open this, it's just the scriptures for those different days, those 40 days. And I just, I love this. In fact, I'm going to read a few of the scriptures out of there in just a second. So, this, so th that's what this is going to be, a, uh, be based on today. And then we will move on with uh, the material that we've developed uh, for the rest of this time. So, his premise, the first four words on the first page of The Purpose Driven Life is, it's not about me. <laughs> It all starts with God. Colossians 1, 16 is that for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank of angels, everything got started in Him and finds its purpose in Him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. all about his purposes. We know this verse very well, and we know that all things work together for the good to those who are called according to his purpose. In verse 29, it says that purpose is to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Now, I'm going to mess up your categories these next weeks, and when we think of being conformed to the likeness of his son, we think we should be doing things like <coughs> Jesus, and we should be Look, our fruit should look like Jesus. When in fact, I've discovered that all he wants me to do is get out of the way so that he can live his life in me so the fruit that comes out will be the fruit that he produces. I can produce no fruit. He says, in me dwells no good thing. He says, the flesh counts for nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. So he was very clear about what I'm capable of. And so now the question is, how do I allow the life of Christ to live it out in me without me getting in the way? And that is the basis of the soul seminar. That is the key. Sanctification, to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Yes. The, the, the word we use, one of the words we use is sanctification. Absolutely. And by the way, we're not going to do any questions until after I'm done the lecture. So write them down, and then we're going to have a group discussion. But you didn't hear that one before yeah. you came in. I'll just, just to let you know. All right. All right. Because you and I can just go I know. back and forth. I know. Here's one for you. This life is not about this life. If you think that this life is about this life, if you're pursuing this life as though it has any intrinsic value, you're missing the point of this life. The point of this life is that we know Him. It's all about God. When you look at, when you look at the way, Je everything Jesus said as an explanation of what He was doing, they said, how do you do this? Where do you get this? He says, it's just the one who sent me. I do only what the one who sent me said. I only do what the Father tells me. I only do what the Father tells me. Every answer he ever gave was, it's the Father doing it in me. 
Now, have you ever really thought about that? And we think that Jesus was doing that stuff because he was God. Well, guess what? He put his Godhead aside, and he was walking around on this earth just like you and me. Why? Because he wanted to show us what it would look like. And so, <laughs> it's all about the Father. It's all about what he wants. It's all about what he does. So, if I am... If I, my focus is on this life, if my focus is on pursuing something of this life, having something in this life, achieving something in this life, any of those things, I am missing the point. I'm, my focus is not where it should be. That's not where Jesus' focus was. Look at his prayer. That they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them. All this is about knowing him and, being in, and him being in me. That's the whole thing. That's all Jesus ever talked about. Jesus didn't talk about, in fact, he said, what did he say about the things of this life? Food, clothing. Don't worry about those things. The most basic needs of life. He said, it's only about seeking the king. <coughs> it's always about the father. So we're going to talk about getting those cares of this life. You've heard of the parable of the sower. And the, th the thorns that choke the word, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the lust for things, that's this life. And if we're pursuing those, then we're not engaging God in the relationship that he made us for. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So life from God's point of view. Rick Warren, in The Purpose Driven Life, tells us these three things. Life is a test, life is a trust, and life is temporary. Look at each one of those. First of all, life is a test. God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. He tests us to see what's in our heart. Remember David in Psalm 51? Anybody ever read Psalm 51? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Every time we mess up, that's where we go. Psalm 51. That's our confession. We open it right up. Well, toward the end of Psalm 51, David says sacrifice I would bring you. Uh, now wait a minute, David. The only way you know to atone for your sins is to make a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'd do that, but I know that's not what you want. Mm -hmm. You want a broken and contrite heart. Now how? David, you don't even, you know no other way. But you see, he was, a, he was described as a man after God's own heart. So he had a relationship with God that probably was deeper than most of his contemporaries and probably most of the people in the Old Testament, would, except a few. Mm -hmm. And so he had this awareness that, I know you're making us go through this sacrifice thing, but I know that's not really it. I know that it's about, you, you want my heart. You're going to test my heart. Mm -hmm. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. The testing of life is normal. And it's within God's plan. He will not let you be tempted or tested beyond what you're able to bear, but with that temptation, he will provide a way out. So the whole testing thing is part of his interaction with you. This is, this is not something that, oh, it just happens because you're living here on this planet and there's bad stuff happening. No, 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 no. The bad stuff that's happening is part of how he's testing your heart. He's looking how you react to those things. He's looking at whether those things are a priority or whether he's the priority. This is the big one. Life is a trust. Trust is the basis of the relationship. When you love someone on this planet, you love them in a variety of ways. In fact, there was, um, I can't remember, I knew his name, Gary Smalley, maybe, uh, five love languages. Okay, five love languages. So there are a variety of ways we love each other. Words of affirmation. Gifts, serving, things like that, physical touch. We do not love God that way. We can't love God that way. The way we love God is that we believe Him and we trust Him. When we do that, He is loved. This is the basis of the relationship that we have with Him, is trust. Now look at this. I'm going to take this out of the Amplified. You know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 by heart. New International is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and that will direct your path. 
Let's look at the Amplified. Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all of your heart and all of your mind. Jesus said that as well. And do not rely on your own insight and understanding. In all your ways, know, <coughs> recognize, and acknowledge Him. And He will direct and make straight and plain and define your path. Now, the Amplified takes the Hebrew or the Greek and expands it so that when, when we just translate something into one word, there might be nuances of meanings. And so it's very wordy, but it gives you a much better flavor of what the words actually mean. And he wants us to trust him. But see, look at it. Lean on, be confident in. This is a posture. And then, in all your ways, know and recognize him. You're looking for him and acknowledge him. And that is what's going to define your path. Now, couple that with following the shepherd. Week five, we're going to be doing a whole section on following the shepherd. What's that look like? Well, how do you follow someone? You have to keep your eye on them because as they make a turn, you make the turn. You have no idea where they're going, but as long as you keep your eye on them. So when I am recognizing him, when I'm looking for him, and he's leading me, that is going to direct my path. So you see... <coughs> This is very significant about walking this earth. He has a plan, and he wants to lead you on it. Now, we're going to talk about how do you recognize that. How do you hear his voice? How, how, do, we, how do we respond to the prompts he gives us each day? That's going to be a part of this. Life is temporary. Does anybody, does anybody doubt that when you die, you're not taking anything with you? Does it, 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 I, I don't know. In fact, you don't have to be a religious person. Every human being on the planet intrinsically knows that when I die, it's done. So what does that say about all of our pursuits and all of our achievements and all of our acquisitions? Well, you can pile them all into the book of Ecclesiastes because that's where it describes what that looks like. It's a chasing after the wind because it will have been useless. So you see, we, we want to make sure... We want to make sure that we have a perspective that this life is not about this life. And so I want to make sure that this life does not rob me of what this life really is about, and that is knowing him and having a relationship with him. The reason for everything, for from him and through him and to him are all things. The Lord works out everything for his own end. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You'll find this all throughout the scriptures. God declares, this is all me. You are mine. But I did make you for a reason. And it was so that I could receive love back. The rest of my creation doesn't love me back. It just does what I make it do. The animals, the plants, the stars, they just do what he made them do. But us... We can choose to love him. He, made, he first loved us, and he wants, since he made us in his image, then let's think about what it is like to be a father, and how you love your children. And how one day you're hoping, you're hoping that your child will love you back, will respect you, will honor you. You, you live for that. Not everybody gets that. Okay? Not, not everybody is blessed enough to have that response. So that's what God is looking for. He's, he first loves us. That's what we do to our children. And then we, he wants us to love him back. That's the reason we're here. So it's like, oh, you mean it's not work and being the president of the company and having a big house and having a big company? No, it's not. Now, um, I, I understand that, that Brother Vic... Um, he, um, a few months ago, actually quite a few months ago, probably, um, ha gave a testimony of a relationship that he has with another brother here, and that brother left, had to go for work or whatever, had to leave. And Brendan and I are going to be sharing in this, in this time, we're going to be sharing uh, how this partnership has assisted us in our growth. We believe this is significant. 
How did Jesus train his disciples? Well, first of all, there was a group. Here it is. Twelve of us. Without Brendan and I, there's twelve of you. So, that's kind of interesting. But, he had a small group. Now, were these all the disciples that he ever had? No. The, the thoughts are that he had hundreds following him. And it was on that day when he said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they said, are you nuts? And they all fell away. And then Jesus looked at the twelve and says, how about you? And Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. You, you know. So there was this small group that was committed to him. Gentlemen, you showing up here at 7 o'clock every Saturday morning for as long as you've been doing, see, I already know your level of commitment. I know that we have a similar priority. And that priority is to know him. That priority is to work with one another so that we lift each other up and we grow in the faith. I know that's your purpose. I know that's your commitment. So that so, so this is a great place for me to do this because you need people that have got that level of commitment if you're going to engage this material. And so these relate tight relationships and trust. But there's something else Jesus did that I think most of us miss. He sent the disciples out in pairs. When he sent out the 72, he didn't send them out to 72 different places because strategically that would have made more sense because he could have covered more ground. Hmm. Now, 36 locations, sending you out in pairs. One significant thing was he said, don't take anything with you. Notice he was sending them out on a trust exercise. I'm going to send you out and let's see if, you can, if God's enough for you. But he also sent them out in pairs. So you see them going out in pairs, you see the disciples on the road to Emmaus. After Jesus was crucified, you have those two disciples, two of them, walking along the road. Jesus joins them, reveals himself to them. And they're both going back and forth. Weren't our hearts just burning within us when he was speaking? They were doing this. So you see this, gentlemen, this is key. This is key. Finding someone that you can be transparent with. Finding somebody that you can just let it all out on the table. Where there's no games. Oh, by the way, there will be games. You won't tell them everything. Okay? But those things that you're hiding will be the things that you will be deceived by. And that is a place where you won't go deeper with God until you have dealt with it. So, trust me. It's not going to be, oh, yeah, everything's cleared up. No, no, no. <laughs> We've been doing this for over a decade. And it, it doesn't work that way. However... This, one thing right here, I believe, is the key to our growth in the past 10 years. Uh, more, more than anything else. Grant, you've got to know the scriptures. You have to know what you believe. You have to apply it yourself. He cannot do it for me. So the buck stops here, as far as responsibility is concerned. But when he looks at my life, and he sees something, when I look at his life, I can see it objectively. He's caught up in the emotion of it. He's caught up in the struggle. And I look at him, and I can say... Hey, look, you're not, you don't have your eyes on Jesus. So our job, the partner's job, in Proverbs 27, 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So we call this time, we call it iron sharpening iron, ISI. Okay? And so we are going to break down at the end, we're going to have a discussion now, we're going to break down at the end, and um, oh, it's part of the practice. This, and this is a very important part of the practice. 